So I find happiness with my family. Um, there's no better place than around them for me. Personally, what brings me joy is I enjoy going to the events or shows. I like represent peace, love, union, and respect. Yeah. Like, I want people to be respectful of each other and just care for one another now. Family's gonna be the biggest thing. Yeah, the biggest thing is family. It's always been something that I've kind of just held on to and was raised with, you know, certain priorities in life. I'm always gonna take it that way. I'm still a student, speech therapy major. So oh. I guess right now, I'm just getting to the next step. I'm a senior this year, so I feel like the fun stuff hasn't started yet. The landscape. It's, it's, it's all about the landscape. I do travel, so I travel a lot. I travel between, you know, all of Western um, United States, down as far as Mexico. So I just go and take a look at all of the landscape that God has provided to us. And I think that in the landscape, it just grounds me to know that there's way bigger things than what's happening in a three mile radius. What are you trying to hope? What are you about? That sounds really good. You guys go over here, where do we find meaning? Uh, we're actually here because Donna was getting baptized and so yeah. for everybody well okay for me for in this group I find hope in that my life is not a thing in and of itself that God has plans for me that reach out to tomorrow and the next day and the next day and that they're good and that he's good and I trust in that. What's the meaning of life? It's a pretty deep profound question. It can be even an, an intimidating question. You know, we took a, a, a small film crew and we went to the waterfront and asked that question, what's the meaning of life? And as we talked to people, it was very interesting that uh, no one would actually try to give an answer. In fact, what people did time and time again, everyone gave the same response. Oh, no, no. I, I don't know. I don't know what the meaning of life is. And then they would say, who am I to, to try to answer that question. This happened time and time again, to the point where we had to change the question. We started asking, well, where do you find meaning in life? Or where do you find hope in life? And then people started to open up. People started to share. People started to talk about what was going on in their life. Oh, well, I, you know, I, I, find, I find some hope or some meaning with my family or in my work or uh, with my hobbies, my interests in life. And what we learned as we did this experiment is that um, the average person doesn't really know what the meaning of life is. However, they're searching and longing for meaning. And so I want to ask you, have you considered, have you thought about what is the meaning of life? I'm curious, how many of you, you've thought about this before? Have you thought about this? See, most of us have. Um, if you're like me, maybe you think about it all the time. Even as a teenager, I started asking that question. What, why am I here? What's, what, is, what is my existence about? And I have been, since then, asking that question. I I'm still thinking about what is the meaning of life? And what we can do is we can dialogue, we can discuss, we can debate, we can have all kinds of very fascinating, interesting conversations. But if we really want to know the answer to that question, we have to go beyond human speculation. I mean, who has the authority, who has the ability, who is really qualified to answer that question? Well, the answer is God. God alone can really truly tell us what is the meaning of life. And so for us to learn about the meaning of life, we have to go to the Word of God. We don't need speculation. We need divine revelation, which is why we open up the Bible. This is God's Word to us. And so we open up the Bible to see what God says about life. We're starting today a new sermon series. We're calling it This Meaningful Life. We're in the book of Ecclesiastes. So you can go ahead and open your Bible there or your Bible app. If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the pews. Feel free to take one. It's our gift to you. If you turn to page 379 in the pew Bibles, um, that'll take you to where we want to be. And what we're doing is we're just going to study this book of, of the Bible for the next three months or so, and we're going to be seeing, like, where is there meaning in life? We're going to ask that question time and time again to see what God says. And so first, I want us to start by looking at chapter 1, verse 1. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, we're told in this verse. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. 
Okay, so who's the son of David? Who's king in Jerusalem? The answer is Solomon. This is talking about King Solomon. Now, what's interesting is Solomon refers to himself not by name, but rather says he's the preacher. And what he's doing is is he's writing this book from the perspective of a preacher who stands before God's people and gathers God's people to hear from God. And so understand that the book of Ecclesiastes is a sermon that's being preached, and it's being preached by Solomon. Now, you may say, who's Solomon? I don't know him. I don't know his story. Let me just tell you a little bit about him that I think is, is needed for us to understand what's going on in this book. Solomon was the third king of Israel. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. He reigned for 40 years as king. And his, uh, his kind of the beginning of his, his journey as king is very interesting. The scriptures tell us in 1 Kings chapter 3 that Solomon had a dream. And in this dream, God showed up and God asked Solomon. He said, Solomon, uh, what can I do to help you? What can I give you? When God shows up and asks you, what can I give you? That's a good day. And Solomon answered that question. He said, well, God, I need wisdom. That's what I need. I don't know how to govern your people. I don't know how to help your people. I don't know how to lead your people. I need wisdom so I can care for your people. And the Bible says that God was pleased with this response because Solomon didn't ask for wealth, because he didn't ask for power, because he didn't ask for long life, because he did not ask for fame. Uh, He didn't ask for his territory to be expanded, because he didn't ask for any of those things. The Lord was pleased, and so the Lord gave him wisdom. And And the Bible also says that God didn't just give him wisdom, he also gave him wealth and honor. Among all the kings on earth at that time, uh, Solomon was the most honored. And you have to understand that the scriptures say that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. So as we look at this book, understand this is is not a guy who dropped out of college, started a blog, and is sharing his muses of life. Okay, that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the wisest man who ever lived, and he's going to share with us some things that we need to hear, we need to learn. In fact, the Bible says that people from every nation would come from all over just to hear Solomon speak because they wanted to hear the wisdom. We're told that he wrote 3,000 proverbs, 1,005 songs, that he also wrote three books of the Bible. As a young man in love, he wrote the Song of Solomon. As a middle-aged man who was a father, he wrote most of the book of Proverbs. As an older man, an, an aged man, reflecting on his life and legacy, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And so Solomon is a wise man, but he's not He's not a perfect man. He has flaws, just like any of us, but he's writing to help us. Okay, what's he doing? What's his aim? What's his purpose? Look at verse 13. We see a glimpse of that here. He says, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And so what I want you to see here is that Solomon has applied his heart, that he has given himself over to seek and to search out by wisdom, this gift of wisdom that God has given him, everything under the sun, everything under heaven. He's looking at everything on earth to discern what's its purpose, what's its meaning. And I believe that he has a very intentional purpose in writing this book, and we see a little glimpse of that in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, so I want to share that with you. It says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by, given by one shepherd. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. It says that these words that are wise, they're like goads and like nails, and they're given by the one shepherd. Who's the one shepherd? Well, that's a reference to God. This is saying that God has given Solomon wisdom and understanding, and Solomon is sharing that with us to help us. Now, in order for us to understand what he's really doing, what he's getting at, I think we have to understand a little bit about his story. So I want to share with you just briefly a little bit about Solomon's story. Like I said, he was a wise man, but not a perfect man. In fact, he had a character defect. And the scriptures tell us about this in 1 Kings chapter 11. And what we're told is that Solomon loved women. He loved foreign women. 
that he loved, loved, loved women. And the Bible says that Solomon was warned by God twice, two times. God spoke to Solomon and said, do not marry foreign women because if you do, your heart will go away from me. They will make you stumble and fall. But yet Solomon did not listen to God and he married foreign women. But you have to understand, Solomon never does anything just a little bit. It's not like he married one woman or two women or even a dozen women. The scriptures say that he married 700 women, okay, who were princesses. And he had 300 concubines. He had 1,000 women. I know some of you, maybe you're married and you're saying, I have one wife and I can barely take care of her. How do you take care of 1,000 women? I have no idea. But it's not what God wanted. In fact, the scriptures say that what Solomon did was evil in the sight of God. And what happened is in his old age, his heart was, was turned away from God because of these women. They all worshiped false gods, and he was persuaded by them. And I think that this is important because what I believe is happening is I believe Solomon is writing to us. He's writing to us saying, look, I have made some big mistakes in my life. I started out strong. My faith was going good. But then I got hung up. I, I, I started focusing on women, and it, and it led to destruction, and my faith went sideways. And so he's writing to help us, to give us wisdom. And we're told here that his words are like goads and like nails. What's a goad? You probably don't even know what that is. I had to look it up myself. A goad is a, is a, long, it's a long stick. It's kind of like a, the staff of a shepherd. It's a long stick that is used to poke animals. And oftentimes what they would do is they would take this long stick and they would put a nail at the end of it and then they would poke a cow or an ox and they would get it moving in the right direction. And so what Solomon is doing here is he's saying, look, I'm at the end of my life and I've learned some things and I've made some mistakes and I want to share those with you. And the words that I'm giving you are from God and what God has taught me. And you need to understand that these, are, these words are like, a, they're like, goad, they're like goads, nails. I'm going to poke you. I'm going to pierce you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prod you in your heart to get you to think about things that are deep. I'm also doing this to warn you, to help you so that you don't, you don't walk into a place of danger. And I want to, I want to get you going in the right direction so that your path is headed towards God. I believe that's what he's doing. And the way he goes about it is very, very interesting. The, the, the book of Ecclesiastes is a part of the wisdom literature. It's considered Hebrew poetry. It doesn't rhyme in the English, but it has a very poetic way about it. I mean, look at the, even the way he's describing his words here. It's very poetic. And there's a point to what he's telling us. It doesn't follow like this linear, logical flow like much of Western literature. Rather, it's like a collage. It's like, a, it's like looking at, have you ever seen one of those paintings where if you're up really, really close, it just looks like a square of color, but then when you stand back, all of a sudden you can see an image? In, in many ways, that's kind of what this book is like. When you're looking at just one verse, you get up really close, it gets a little fuzzy. Like, what is he talking about? But when you step back, you realize, okay, he's telling us about life, and you're able to see what he's doing. And the way he goes about it is just very fascinating. He'll ask questions, he'll answer question, and he's gonna, questions, and he's going to share observations, and he's going to get us thinking. He starts in verse 3 by asking a very important question. Let's look at it. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So he's basically saying, what's the point of life? All this hardship, all this toil, all this struggle, like what's the point of it all? And then he's going to go on to make some observations. He's going to say, well, let's look, at, let's look at this one area of life. Let's look at this one area of life. And he's going to actually point out three things that he wants us to look at in chapter 1. And so the first thing he says is, well, let's just look at humanity in general. We see this in verse 4. He says, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Right? What is he talking about? He's saying, look, people are born, people live, people die. But it life goes on. I mean, a generation comes and a, gener a generation goes. You, he's saying, look, you, you, you're just a little, you're a little blip on the, on the radar of humanity. Boop, there you are. You, there, now you're gone. You were there. Now you're gone. He's, he's saying, if you're, if you're only going to be born to live and die and that's it, like what, what's, what's the meaning? What's the meaning? He's showing us 
that one day will be forgotten if our hope is only on the things of this earth. I mean, think about this. Okay, do you know the names of your great, great grandparents? I do not know the names of my great, great grandparents. For most of us, my, my guess is that you probably don't know the names of your great, great grandparents. And if you do, then you're in a minority. Do you know the names of your great, great, great grandparents? I doubt it. What that means is that we're going to die, and within just a, just a few generations, we're going to be forgotten by even our own family. Not forgotten by God, but forgotten by even our own family. And Solomon is saying, well, what's the meaning? What's the meaning? He goes on to, to say, well, let's observe just nature and the way that, that the earth kind of functions. We see this in verses 5 through 7. He says, the sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Now here, what is he talking about? He's talking about how it just seems that there's a, an ongoing cycle of weather and seasons and time. He's saying, you know, this, the sun, it's going to rise and then it's going to go down. And that happened today and it's going to happen tomorrow, and it happened yesterday, and it's going to continue to happen. And there's going to be seasons that just continue. He's talking about the wind blowing from one direction to another. He's talking about the, the streams and the rivers and how they, they funnel into the, to the ocean. You know, think about it. The summer happened, and now it's the fall. Well, that happened last year. It was the summer and, and then fall. Next year, it'll be the summer, then fall. And what happens? It's summer, and then the fall hits, and we all know what's coming once the fall hits. Rain, darkness. This is what happens in the Northwest. Some of you, you know that the rain and the darkness is coming and you are excited for it, right? You're, the, you're true Northwesterners. Others are saying, yeah, I'm not I like the sun and I, I'm not looking forward to what's about to happen. Some of you, maybe you're new to the area and you're saying, yeah, yeah, everybody always talks about it like it's a big deal, uh, just wait. Right? We'll see how you respond. But it happens every year. So if it doesn't go well for you this year, guess what? Next year you can try it again. That's what Solomon's talking about. He's saying there's just this kind of this endless cycle and it's just happening. The same thing year after year after year. What's the meaning of it all? From there he goes on to talk about human achievement. He's going to talk about just all human achievement. And we see this in verses 8 through 11. He says, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. So, so notice what he's saying here. He's saying everything, it's all, it's all just, it's just full of weariness. It's not going to satisfy, right? I, any kind of achievement that can be achieved, it's not going to fulfill you completely. That's what he's talking about. He goes on, he says in verse 9, what has been, it, uh, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. And then he asked this question, is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? The answer is no. Now, some of you would say, yeah, but last week the new iPhone 7 came out. That was new. But think about it. It will be a short time before it's obsolete, and then there will be the iPhone 8, which is the point he's making. He's saying there's just this, this, this cycle from one thing to the next. He goes on in verse 10. Uh, and, and when he says, is there a thing that is new? No. He says, it has been already in the ages before us. Uh, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. He's saying, you know what? Uh, we don't know about what happened a thousand years ago and exactly what life was like, and we're not going to know about what happens a thousand years from now. But guess what? It's not going to be that different from what's happening right now. Understand, he's not saying there won't be new uh, discoveries, there won't be new innovations, there won't be new technologies. He's not talking about that. He's just simply saying life seems to stay the same. Life seems to stay the same. He's saying there's this kind of this endless cycle. Nothing is new under the sun. It doesn't matter how creative you are. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. It doesn't matter how uh, successful you are. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. 
You're stuck in this endless cycle. Nothing is new under the sun. It just continues. It just continues. It just continues. I mean, think about this. What's going to happen tomorrow? Monday, you're going to wake up. And you're going to do what you always do when you wake up. You're going to get ready. You're going to go to work. You're going to work throughout the day. You're going to come home. You might have dinner, hang out with some friends, some families, you know, maybe watch a show on TV. Maybe you go online for a little bit and kind of goof off or whatever it is you normally do. And then you're going to go to sleep and you're going to do what on Tuesday? The same thing. The same thing. That's what he's saying. It's just this endless cycle. Right? You mow your lawn, and it's just a matter of time before you have to mow your lawn again. You get your hair cut, it's just a matter of time before you have to get your hair cut again. Uh, you do the dishes, and then you make dinner, and what, ha- what do you have to do? You gotta, now you got to do the dishes again. Uh, you do laundry, and it's just like a day or two goes by, and you're like, I need to do laundry again. If you have little ones, maybe even babies, uh, you, you change a diaper, and you blink, and now you got to change the diaper again. This is what happens. Nothing new under the sun. It just continues, it continues, it continues. I know you understand what he's talking about. This is why you're bored. This is it. This mo- m- kind of monotony of life. This is why you find yourself just going, man, I'm kind of bored. Kind of bored today. Your boredom testifies that there is nothing new under the sun. Your boredom testifies that you are stuck in this endless cycle of nothing new. Solomon is making these observations. He's saying, see, look at, look at, look at humanity and look at nature and just look at all that we've accomplished and achieved as a people. What's the point? What's the meaning of it all? And he gives us his conclusion in verse 2. So let's look at verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Right? There are moments in, in the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon speaks like a, like a madman, where he's just talking in, in a way where you're like, Wow, that's just super intense. This is one of those moments. You, you have to read this and understand. He's saying, vanity, vanity. He's saying it, it's meaningless. That's what he's doing. Right? This is one of those moments when, when, when Solomon just goes completely gothic. Right? He's got like the eyeliner on his eyes, and he lights all the candles and turns off the lights and puts on his, his, his nine-inch nails, and he's just like, oh, the point of, of it all is, is meaningless. That's what's happening here. Okay? The word vanity in Hebrew is hebel. And that word is, is the theme of the book. It shows up, um, it's, it's 37 times throughout the book in 30 different verses. And the word means this. It means a mist, a vapor, a breath. It's a puff of air. It's, it's here and gone. It means futile, elusive, meaningless. That's what it means. In the NIV, it actually says, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He's saying, look, there's so many things in life that are just, they're they're temporal. They're futile. They're here and they're gone. And and they're, they're meaningless. I know right now you're thinking, wow, that's a bummer. (laughs) Right? Um... Thanks, Pastor, for let, let's study that book for, you know, like, uh, you, you're not wanting to invite Solomon to come to your house and hang out, right? You're saying, this is the guy who's probably a, you know, he's a, he's a downer. Like, what, what is he, like, this is a, this is a bummer. Uh, you got to understand what he's doing, okay? His words are like goads. Like, he's, he's got intentionality. He's poking us. He's trying to prod us. He, he's, he's, he's intentional in what he's doing. You see, It isn't until you're willing to face meaninglessness that you're able to actually find meaning. That's what Solomon knows. It isn't until you're willing to face the meaninglessness of life that you're able to then find where there really is true meaning. It's kind of like knowing that the Grand Canyon is beautiful. Maybe maybe you've heard someone say, yeah, the Grand Canyon's beautiful, but... You're, you don't really fully understand the beauty of the Grand Canyon until what happens. 
until you actually walk up to the, to the edge. When you're standing there on the edge of the canyon and you're looking down and you see the depth of the canyon, you see how far it goes down, how deep it actually is. And in that moment, you start to, to feel a little bit afraid. Like, what if I fall off the edge? What if I fall down there? Or there's this, this moment where the vastness of the Grand Canyon makes you sm feel smaller than small. And it's in that moment when you're feeling really small that you actually are able to see the beauty of it. And that's like life. That's what Solomon's talking about. He's saying, you got to face the meaninglessness of it all in order to find meaning. What he's doing here is he's revealing this tension that exists with, within each and every one of us. This great tension, right? You, you look at everything under the sun. You look at everything, and there are those moments in life where you say, it's just, it's just meaningless. There's no point. And yet, in that very same moment, you say, but I know there's supposed to be meaning, right? That's the tension. That's the tension. Everything's meaningless, but yet I know in my heart of hearts that there's supposed to be meaning. I know in my heart of hearts that my existence is not futile. I know that. And, and, I, and there's this tension that exists. And that's what Solomon is talking about. How, how does this tension affect us? I would suggest that it, it actually impacts our life in many ways, relationally, emotionally, spiritually. How did it affect Solomon? He, he's going to share some of his own experience. Let's look at verses 14 through 18. He says, I've seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Again, he's saying, I looked at everything there is under the sun, and I gave myself over to this pursuit of searching out, trying to find meaning. And notice what he says. I think this is very interesting. He says in verse 17, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. What he's doing here is he's helping us understand just how much effort he actually put into it. He said, I applied myself to know wisdom. He's saying, I went to the best schools and I learned from the best and brightest professors. I went to Harvard. I learned there uh, from, from the, best, the best professors they had. He's saying things like this, like I learned how to do computer programming from Bill Gates. I learned how to do physicists from Albert Einstein. He's saying, I looked in all the places of wisdom to look for meaning. I looked, you know, is there wisdom in philosophy? Is there wisdom in mathematics? Is there wisdom in... Uh, in science? Is there, is there wisdom in literature? He's saying, I looked in all those high places of knowledge and understanding for meaning. But I didn't just look there. I also went to the low places, the dark places, what he calls madness and folly. I mean, think about that. He went to the depth of the darkness of the human condition to see if there was meaning there as well. He, he was he gave himself over to folly. You know, this is, this is him saying, you know, I was hanging out with the cast members of the movie Jackass and we were being fools and, and, and it, was, it was just madness. This is him saying, I was hanging out with, the, with the, the most beautiful and the richest, the most famous people on earth and we gave ourselves over to our desires and our, and our lusts. We're going to talk about that more next week. He's saying, nothing, nothing held us back other than our imagination. I mean, this is, the, this is the man who is king. He has more money he could ever spend. He has power to do whatever he wants. And he's saying, and I did it all. I did it all. And his conclusion is vanity, meaningless. He says, it's just a striving after the wind. I mean, think of that, that imagery. What happens? You chase wind. You try to grab the wind. What do you get when you grab the wind? 
nothing. Nothing. That's what he's saying. I went after it, and there was, there was nothing there. And then he shares with us how it affected him emotionally in verse 18. He says, for in much wisdom is much vexation. That word means trouble or distress. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. He's saying, when it was all said and done, I just had a lot of distress. I had a lot of despair. I was filled with sorrow. I went right there to the, to the edge of it all, the meaninglessness, and I looked it right in the face, and it brought about sorrow. Have you ever had one of those moments when you're just looking at life and questioning, like, what's the point of all this? And then there's, there's kind of a, this overwhelming feeling of sorrow or despair. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Recently, there was an interview on Conan O'Brien, and uh, it was an interview with Louis C.K., who is a comedian, okay? He's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. As best as I can tell, he's an agnostic. And he said some things that were very, very interesting. And I want to quote him because I want to I I let his words speak for themselves. This is what he said. He said, Underneath everything in your life, There's that thing, that empty, forever empty, that knowledge that it's all for nothing and you're alone. It's down there. It's down there inside you. Okay, this is a man who has risen to the top of his profession, a world-renowned comedian, And he's sharing this experience he had. He went on to say how he was driving down the highway in a car, and he's driving, and all of a sudden, there was this flood over him of what he calls the forever empty. He's saying, all of a sudden, I felt it, and it was there. And he was tempted to try to push it away, but he didn't do that. He said that he actually pulled his car over to the side of the road and just wept. He just cried. He's just sitting in the sadness. What's he talking about? He's talking about looking at the meaninglessness of life. That's what he's talking about. And he's sharing this story, and as he's sharing this story, the audience, he's a comedian, so he's funny, the the audience is laughing, right? They're laughing at what he's saying, but 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 Conan O'Brien, if you watch his face, he's just kind of like, he's looking at him, he's, you know, I imagine he's thinking like, wow, you are really sharing something really deep and profound. But people are laughing because it's it's uncomfortable. They're laughing because they don't know how to respond to it. See, here's the point. Whether you're a believer, a Christian, or not a Christian, we all share this similar experience where there are moments in life where we're in that tension of the meaninglessness of it all. And when we have those moments, it brings great sorrow. So so what do we do? Like, how do we respond to the meaninglessness? I think there are some ways that we try to deal with it, ways that we try to cope with the meaninglessness that are not helpful And I want to share some of those with you because I'm hoping to help you. Okay, so what are ways that we try to cope with the meaninglessness? The first way that I have observed is some people, they just ignore. They ignore it, right? Some people, they they see the meaninglessness and then they are like, oh, I'm I'm going to pretend like I didn't see that. No, no, right? Those are the people who, you know, they're they're, they're kind of living in a very kind of shallow, surfacey existence. You don't want to talk about deep things. Don't want to talk about hard things. No, no, don't want to talk about that, right? Those are the people that even now they're saying, I don't like the sermon pastor, putting their fingers in the ear, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to listen. You can try to ignore it, but it won't make it go away. I know a guy who tried to ignore it. He was a construction worker, and he felt like his life was meaningless. And so the way that he tried to ignore it was very creative. What he did is he actually always talked about, hey, in the future, I'm going to retire, right? I'm not going to deal with this right now, but in the future, I'm going to retire. 
my circumstances are going to change. And when my circumstances change, then all this meaninglessness is going to go away. That was basically what he was doing. He's very creative in the way that he ignored it. And so he spent his life thinking about the future. And what happened is, is that he retired. And shortly after, you know, a few years after, he was dead. He was dead. He was not an old man, but he was still dead. It's as though he, he was saying, it's meaningless, but this will give me meaning. And then when he got to that place, he realized, oh, it's also meaningless. Right? If, if you ignore it, it will not go away. Eventually, you have to face it. Eventually, you have to face it. One of the other ways that people try to cope with the meaninglessness is escape. Right? We we, we see that life is meaningless, and then we say, oh, I don't like that, so I'm going to just, I'm gonna just check out, right? I'm going to preoccupy myself with something else. And understand, there are limitless opportunities for you to escape in our culture, in our society. And so there are all kinds of ways that people do this. Some people escape uh, through entertainment. I'm going to, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to watch a movie or I'm going to play a game online, right? I'm going to create an avatar. I'm going to enter into this world online, and I'm going to devote myself to it. And there, I'll really live life. Life out here in the real world is, is meaningless, but in, he, in this world, in this fake world, in this false world, I can be something. And so they escape to something else. There are other ways that people do this, though. For some people, they escape through, um, through food. I don't feel good. I'm down. I'll eat. I uh, feel really good. Let's celebrate. Let's eat. Uh, I'm bored. Let's eat. It's just an escape. It's an escape. For other people, it might be uh, medicating themselves with substance. Hard, hard week at work. Um, let's go hit happy hour. Like, let's get, let's get wasted. That'll make things better. There are all kinds of ways that people escape. I knew a guy who literally escaped his life. He faked his death. Okay, he was married, he had kids, and he, he, was, he, he was meaningless in, in some regards, and he felt that. And so his, his solution was, well, I'm going to escape. So he faked his own death, and then he moved across the country and started living this life of lust and perversion. He just gave himself over to it. It didn't solve the problem. It just brought a lot of pain and suffering to all the people he loved. Right? You can escape. You will be able to escape. You can preoccupy yourself. You can be very busy doing nothing. You'll even laugh. You might have some fun. It will not solve the problem. It won't do it. It won't do it. It's not the solution. How else do we cope with meaninglessness? The third way is sometimes people quit. Some people, they, they, they're face to face with just how meaningless life is and it, that, that, that sorrow, that sadness becomes, it becomes too much and they think, I just wanna be done, I wanna end my life. Right? I, just, I just don't wanna live anymore. In extreme examples, this, th these are people who take their own life and they commit suicide. Now, I know when we talk about those kinds of things, it gets a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes people will think, well, sh sh should we talk about that? And the answer is yes, we need to talk about it because it's a reality and a problem of this broken world. I mean, anytime you have a group of people who get together, you have to understand some of us have considered ending, ending our lives. Some of us. Some of us are affected because someone we care about, someone we, we know, we love, they ended their life, and it, is, it has brought great pain into our life. You may not be aware of this. One of the leading causes of death in the United States is suicide. And in the state of Washington, there is a significantly higher rate of suicide than in other states in our nation. This is a problem in our community. This is a problem in our lives. Uh, pastor Zach, who's one of our pastors, he's a volunteer pastor. Vocationally, he's a police officer. And he was sharing how um, every year about 30 people try to jump off the Narrows Bridge. 
Okay? You're not going to read a story about that in the newspaper. They're not going to publish that story. But every year, about 30 people, and he said that about 70% of them actually do it. And twice in his career, he's had uh, a situation where he was personally involved in one of those, those moments. Once, he said that there was a, a man who was on the bridge, and he was thinking about jumping, and he ran up and just grabbed him and pulled him off, and he saved his life. Another time, he ran up to the bridge, and there was a woman who was hanging on, and she looked at him right in the eyes, and she just let go and fell to her death. I mean, just try to imagine what that's like to see that, to experience that. It's devastating. As I was preparing to share with you, I really felt God put on my heart that if we're going to go to the to the edge of meaninglessness. If we're gonna go there, if we're gonna get up to that place, we're gonna look it in the face, we have to understand that that's gonna bring some people to, 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 to draw a wrong conclusion. If it's so broken, then why don't I just end it all? Right? That's not from God, that's from the enemy. That's not of God. Listen, if you have considered such things Hear me in this. You are not alone and you are loved. And that is not what God wants for you. It's not what he wants for you. Right? You're not alone. Right? You, you have a community of people who are here and God loves you and we love you. That's not the answer. It's not the solution. What I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you is if you've considered such things Talk about it. Share it. Talk to me after service. Talk to one of the pastors after service. If you came here with a friend, talk to your friend. Talk to someone. Like, share, share with them. This is what's been going on. I'm really struggling. I'm really hurting, and I need some help. We want to help you. Some people think, well, I'll just quit. No. No. It's not the answer. It's not the answer. How else do we cope with meaninglessness. The fourth way I want to share with you is this idea that we, uh, we create. Right? So for some people, they look at the meaninglessness of life and they say, I'm going to reject that. And the way I'm going to reject it is I will create meaning. I'm going to, I'm going to build something. I'm going to make something. I'm going to bring meaning to my life. And this is the American dream. This is what most people in our culture do. There's someone thinking right now, well, you know what? Life seems meaningless. I'll start a business, and then I'll, I'll have a meaningful life. There's someone thinking, you know, life seems meaningless. I'll find that, that special relationship with that special someone, and then life will be meaningful. Right? This is what we do. We think, if I have this, if I build this, if I get this, then life will be meaningful. And so we strive to create. Now, understand... The act of creating itself is good. It's imaging God. But if you're trying to create to give yourself meaning, then you're actually doing a form of idolatry. You're not actually being, um, image, you're not actually imaging God in creation. In the, in, you know, if you start a business, that's good. But if you're starting it to find your meaning, that's not a good thing for you. And it's not going to work. I know a gal who, she was married, not a good marriage, right? And, and um, you know, she, she was what most people would probably describe her as like a, a frumpy housewife. Not a good marriage, wonderful kids, bad marriage. And there's a lot of just meaninglessness there. She was stuck in that endless cycle. Nothing's new, nothing's new, nothing's new. This is how she responded. She, she wanted to create meaning. And so what she did is she divorced her husband and she became a bodybuilder. Okay, that's what she did. And she started working out a lot, and she got super buff and ripped, and she started entering the competitions. And what happened is she changed her physical appearance, but inwardly, she was still hurting. She was still broken. And she thought, if I do this, it'll bring meaning in my life, but it didn't work. She tried to create meaning, but it didn't work. I share these things with you because 
We all are tempted in different ways to, to, to really deal with the meaninglessness of life. You know, what, what is your proclivity? What do you naturally just kind of, you know, lean towards? Do you ignore? Do you escape? Do you want to quit? Or do you create? I think understanding that about yourself is really important because as, as you start to give yourself over to those things, you can identify what's really going on in your heart. I'll confess with you, for me, I'm someone who will escape, but I'm, I'm pretty boring in my, my methods of escape. You know, I don't try to um, fake my own death. Um, what I typically will, will do is I will binge watch shows on, on Netflix, right? And, and maybe you can identify with that. Maybe you can say, yeah, uh, you know, I, ju I just finished up, you know, the newest season of whatever your show is. We do these things. And, and while we do them, we're, we're trying to somehow deal with this tension. Life is meaningless, but I know I'm, I, I'm supposed to have meaning I know there's, it's supposed to be meaningful. What do we do with that? Like, where do we go? What, where do we look? I'll tell you. This is what Solomon did. Solomon looked at everything on earth under the sun. So he's looking at everything on earth. And what we need to do is we need to do something different. We need to look not at everything on earth, but we need to actually look at things above. The scriptures say, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated, and that's where you find life. I asked you this question earlier. What's the meaning of life? I'll give you the answer. The answer is this. The meaning of life is knowing the giver of life. That's the meaning. Right? The meaning of life is knowing, loving, being in relationship with the giver of life. Right? God created you with intentionality and purpose. He made you in his image and likeness as an image bearer. You have dignity, value, and worth. And he's, he's made you so that you would know him and you would have relationship with him. That's the point. That's the meaning of it. So that you would know your creator and experience the joy of being in relationship with him. You see, in Solomon's day, he said, there's nothing new under the sun. And he was correct. In his day, there was nothing new under the sun. But after Solomon died, something happened. Something happened that was new. Something happened that Solomon could never ever, in a, in a million years, he would have never conceived of such things. Something happened. Something new. God did something new. What was it that God did? God got off of his throne in heaven. He was in glory in heaven, and he got off his throne, and he entered into, into our world. Into, he came to earth in humility. That was new. That never happened before. And then God added humanity to his divinity. He took on flesh. He became a, a person, a human, and he lived among us. He actually entered into that, that endless cycle of nothing new. He entered into that to identify with our suffering, to identify with our sorrow. That was new. And then God did a work we could never do. He went to the cross and died in our place for our sin. That was new. I know some people are like, I don't like that word sin. Sin just means missing the mark. You have to understand, when we try to deal with the meaninglessness of life apart from God, we, we go to a place of sin. We're missing the mark. And God died for that sin. It took the death of God to, to make a way so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be redeemed. And God did that new work for us. And the Bible says that, 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 that God was placed in a tomb, and on the third day he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. That was new. I mean, who, who is risen from the grave never to die again? Only Jesus. No one else. And the Bible says this, that right now Jesus is on a throne in heaven 
After he rose, he ascended into heaven. He's on a throne in heaven. And the scriptures say this, that Jesus has spoken these words. This is a quote. Jesus has said, Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus is making all things new. Because he has dealt with sin, because he has risen from the grave, he is able to make all things new. The scriptures say when you believe in Christ, you are made a new creation. New spirit, new heart, new desires, new identity. You're made a new person. Understand, Jesus living and dying and rising was a work so that God could break that endless cycle of nothing new. So that there could be something new, something of meaning. And he has done this work for you. He has done this work for you. And it even gets better because there's a promise that Jesus is going to return. And when he returns, he's going to establish a new heavens and, and a new earth. Right? This, this earth that is broken, that is, that is just meaningless. He's going, to, he's going to redeem it all. And he's going to establish a new earth. And those who are in Christ will rise from the grave to receive resurrected, glorified bodies, never to die again. And out of heaven will come this new city, the city of Jerusalem, that will be on earth. And on that day, we're told that God will give us a new name. You'll get a new name. God's going to rename you. And we'll sing a new song. And the scriptures even tell us the lyrics. Worthy is God who was slain for our redemption. My concern is that when you are face to face with meaninglessness, you will try to somehow find something new under the sun apart from Christ. Which means if you look, if you search, if you give yourself over to all these other things, you will never find meaning. You'll only find despair. In order to find the meaning of life and the meaningful life, you have to see Jesus and receive Jesus. There is no other, no other solution, no other, no other option that will work for you. Some of you, you've lived your life and it's been meaningless. You've lived without living. And today is the day when God does something new in you and gives you salvation there's this story in the scriptures about a man named Nicodemus who went to Jesus and he said, you know, Jesus, I can tell you about the kingdom of God. And he was really asking, like, what, what is life supposed to be about? You know, what, what, what do I need to do? How do I respond to you, Jesus? And Jesus said, you need to be uh, born again. How can I be born again? I'm an old man. Like, what? what? Jesus said, you need to be born again by God the Holy Spirit. He was talking about him being spiritually born again, receiving new life. He went on to say this. Jesus said, believe, believe. If you're sitting there right now and you're saying, I want to go from meaninglessness to meaning, what do I do? The answer is believe in Jesus. That's it. Believe that he's God. Believe that he lived without sin. Believe that he died for your sin. Believe that he rose from the grave. Believe that he's coming back. Believe that he alone is able to give new life. Believe. And what happens is when you believe, you become a new creation, and you get a new mind and a new perspective. And what that means is that even if you're in a place where you're saying, I feel like I'm stuck in this endless cycle of nothing new, you know in your heart of hearts that even in that place, when you're facing the, the, the meaninglessness, that there is meaning in Christ. Your heart is not full of sorrow, but rather joy because of Jesus. That's what happens. That's what I want for you. That's the invitation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending Jesus to redeem us. And God, we confess there are ways that we try to cope with the meaninglessness of life that are not beneficial, that are sinful, actually. 
Forgive us, Lord, for the times we ignore it. Forgive us for trying to escape it. Forgive us for wanting to quit. Forgive us for trying to create some kind of meaning apart from you. God, we acknowledge you alone are able to give meaning. You alone are able to make all things new. And we ask God, make us new. Give us new life. Give us minds that are new and hearts that are new and lives that are new. We ask Holy Spirit, empower us to rejoice in Jesus as our meaningful life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.